Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network. What was it? Science didn't know, but dedicated scientists were willing to risk their lives to find out. This is Michael Feely, and you're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the UK's biggest paranormal network, and this is Paranormal Dimensions with David Young. Hello, and welcome to another show. Thank you for that intro, Michael. Okay, today's show, if you're a fan of ancient aliens, you're going to love this one. I'm sure you're a fan of uh, ancient aliens. I love the show because it takes you to all the places you'll probably never get to go, unless you're very lucky, of course. The guest today is Bennett J. Vonderhyde. He has appeared on uh, Ancient Aliens. His speciality is the Namoli Stones. Okay, just before that, if you'd like to get in touch with me at all, um, if you'd like to email about with any comments or suggestions, or well just about anything please do always looking forward to receiving emails and communications i'll always try to answer if i can personally david young 2qn at yahoo.co.uk that's david young 2qn all one word at yahoo.co.uk okay i think right now i'm going to get right in and introduce bennett j vonderheide also known as Ben von der Hyde, actually, mostly, I believe. Okay. Hello, Ben, and welcome to the show. Well, thank you, David, for having me. It's and been a, it's a great pleasure. I've been looking forward to this one. I'm a great uh, Ancient Aliens fan, uh, and you are pretty well up on the Namoli Stones, as I understand it, which I don't know very much about, so I'm very intrigued to hear all about them, and, and about you, of course. Well, the Stones are are more intriguing so uh, but yes I, I appreciate the opportunity and it's not you're not alone very few people know anything of the Mali stones they have been powerfully and successfully suppressed by many forces right. over a long period of time although there was a time when they were much more widely known so are we talking about like the the, the the secret cabal that sort of rules this planet, really? Are, are they the ones that are suppressing the information? Well, I, I don't know. I wouldn't identify them. I don't know who they are. I've never, never, I've never seen anybody be able to identify exactly who they are, at least not to hmm. my knowledge. But I, I'm speaking about a political, religious, medical, uh, financial yeah, and which cultural. would be the cabal, really, to be honest. That, that, um... yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I call it the kibosh, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> that's for the kibosh by the cabal. <laughs> that could make sense. <laughs> but, uh, you know, they have, they. in fact, when we started along this journey with uh, my son and I a couple, of few years ago, the, where, which led to this podcast tonight, we went online and we had... Uh, uh, been asked by Professor Kwakua Foyanza to reach out in regards to a book that we're compiling information on, which would be the first ever book of the Nomali figurines, mm. ancient artifacts, and the gods, the uh, deities they're associated with. And my son did an outreach in the in the uh, in the in the internet, and he tried to find anybody who had experience or knowledge that we could incorporate into our research and it was astounding no one when we went specifically to groups that would be knowledgeable on such things such as those in tune with the ancient alien theories those in tune with crystal power healing mm -hmm. stones those who would be expert in artifacts and across the board there was no 
experience or knowledge that Nomali had ever existed. Mm -hmm. And so I went to the gem show up out of side of New York, a very large gem show, and I set up in a booth with a couple stones for a few days. And, and again, 10,000, 20,000 people walked through that show over three days. And not one of them, well, that just, that's not accurate. There were a couple art uh, ex experts from Africa who knew of them, but no one had ever uh, in the uh, normal course of the healing and in the crystals and the stones had heard them. So we went and set up a booth at the MUFON, which is the Mutual UFO Network. Yeah. And, uh, and we went there and, and actually the keynote speaker was Bill Burns, who started the TV show UF Hunters many yeah. years ago yeah. and, and it appears often on Ancient Aliens. And um, I set up a booth there and anticipated for sure these people would be aware. But uh, lo and behold, again, not one person had ever heard of the stones. I got Bill, and I, I called him over to the booth, and I said, Bill, I want to show you these. Have you ever heard of No Mali and, and seen these figurines? And he walked over, and he said, no. Huh. And I thought, wow, you know, these this is really something. So then we said, well, you know, we better check it out, see if I just didn't get uh, horn swaggled, as we would say in the old days, and, and this whole this information I'm getting from the bush and my friend back many many moons ago, who's off planet now, um, you know that all been a bunch of hogwash. But and and even the experiences that we'd had are they just because uh, placebo effect? We believed that they were going to happen, perhaps. Mm. So we started digging up, and no, 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 Mali were first identified by Portuguese sailors in the late 1400s. And they were found in West Africa, only in Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. They were first written about in 1855, Thompson on New York. They were also written about in the late 1800s, and very briefly with another con, con, uh, with another text, if you will. Mm -hmm. the, they were written about in the late 1800s a couple of times. 1917, Irwin. Uh, Edward Irwin, let me get this right. Yeah. Yeah, let me get this right. It's been a while since I did a podcast. My head, you got to edit this. <laughs> no, that's all right. Sometimes my head swirls because I got other missions that we just got off the fight <laughs> with the court. Uh, our listeners are very forgiving. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah, so there you go. Anyways, uh, in 1917, Walter Edwin wrote a few interesting pages in his book, A Journal of Negro History. And uh, and then in the 1950s, you'll, I'm sure you're, many of your listeners are aware of Thor Heyerdahl. Thor Heyerdahl, yeah. The East yeah, Island, he, yeah. Yeah, awesome character. Was well, it, he, uh, 55, was it? I think it was the, the Contiki exhibition. Yeah, the Contiki was before that. Yeah. But he also, in 1955, uh, maybe a chip line. I'm sure. <laughs> Yeah, I believe. Let me say, I'll double check it. But um, in 19, well, let me say this. Your listeners will all likely many know, as you said, uh, Thor Heyerdahl. Well, not only did he do the Contiki, but he also led the first expedition of Easter Island. And in that expedition, they dis discovered the smaller stones, which are found in the caves of Easter Island. Right. The, are they called the secret stones? I've got a note here. Is that right? Yeah, they were figurines. And what he said in his book in, 18, in 1955 was that the stones which he found in Easter Island were most closely uh, resembled the Nomali stones from West Africa. So he mentioned them also in his book. And then you get to the 1990s and we, we find Angelo Petoni, an interesting character in and of his own right, if it weren't for a couple of pictures, there'd be no proof he even existed. Huh. Um, and Angelo was in charge of excavating for diamonds. A lot of the Nomali story wraps around diamonds. And he was looking for diamonds, and they were known to be found wherever Nomali figurines were located. So he had an interest. But he also at one time went to the to the chiefs and he said uh, listen I know you have a contention that diamonds are part of the heavens that fell with the Nomali gods when they were turned to stone and rained upon this part of the world and so if they fell down to the earth you must know where they fell 
figuring if they can show them where these stones fell, they might find diamonds. And they said, yes, but we can't take you. The shaman can take you. They hooked him up with a shaman, and he went, and he found the blue stone, blue sky stone, and he found a nomoli. And there was a show done in the lower 1990s called Unexplained Mysteries. And uh, in that show, he was in there talking about that stone. Inside that stone, he thought he heard a vibration. And so he excavated it, and they identified there was a round object inside it. They excavated it. There was no obvious place where it had been opened up and this had been put in. It just seemed to be in the middle of this carved stone. And the strata that that stone was found in was dated at 17,000 years old. Wow. They took, they excavated it, and they found inside that Nomali figurine a round bearing, metal bearing, which later, on, under um, experimentation at various European facilities, uh, was determined to contain chromium, which, of course, was not identified until much later. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. So where did that come from? This is a question that uh, no one has an answer to. Klaus Nana was involved in the investigation of that. You may know him. He's well familiar with, uh, well, well known in the area of out of time objects. Or objects out of time, I think would be the better way to say it. Yeah. I, I think he's got a book as well, isn't he? Books. Uh, he was appeared on that show. He's been in, in the circles for many, many years. Highly respected. Hmm. Yeah. Oh, it's fascinating. So it's actually definitely chromium. But so it was analysed and everything, was it? Yeah, and let me just put it on hold a second here. Sure. Right. here. My memory is really good, David. It's just very short. <laughs> I know the theory. Don't worry. <laughs> Let's see here. These are all my son's notes. Let's talk about chromium. Crowley, yeah, Klaus Donner, 1990s, Angelo Paterno was managing Sierra Rosa Diamond Excavations. He found the dinosaur type in Omali. Carbon dated, let me requote that. The Nomali that Angelo found was carbon dated to 17,000 years old. He later stated he thought it was making a noise. He took it, had x-rays, called a specialist, drilled it, and found a chromium ball after they identified an object in their x-rays in the stomach of the, you know, all the figurines. Well, it's one of the weirdest things I've ever heard. <laughs> Klaus Donner is well, from, well known in his circles uh, for studies in the areas of objects out of time. Hmm. And he had it tested in, in many universities and laboratories in Switzerland and Germany and Austria it was, oh, wait, 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 change back. I just shifted over there. Here we go. I'm going to talk now about the mysterious sky stones, the sky stones that they found, with the blue sky stones that, cloud, that uh, so along, uh, okay, here we go. Angelo Petoni also discovered the blue sky stones. They were sent and tested in many universities, laboratories, Switzerland, Germany, Austria. It was determined that they were definitely artificial, the blue, and it was unidentifiable, made, uh, constructed of an unknown element is what they just uncovered. So the sky blue color is a complete mystery. There's no idea where that came from. Hmm. You know, I have seen a picture of it. It is a very bright sky blue, is it? Like you, like you've described. Translucent blue, almost. Isn't yeah. It? I mean, also, obviously, I could actually put photos on the uh, Paranormal Dimensions page when this goes out. Um, so, if anyone wants to look at the pictures, they can. And also, you could go to your site. You've got a website as well, which we'll talk about at the end, the, the, towards the end. Point people in that me, direction. Yeah, let me get this correct too, uh, in case you decide to use it more accurately. And, and I want to. I'd like to quote here, because this will make sure it's accurate. The, uh, the indigenous population have a legend saying that diamonds are stars, 
which fell from the sky. And joking with him one day, Petoni said, but if the stars fell, then so too must the sky have fallen. The reply was, yes, and we know where it fell. A local shaman brought him to the place where they were, and uh, they found some sky stone in the ground, on the ground first. Digging into the ground, he found over uh, 200 kilograms. Um, it wasn't in a natural formation, but it was set in the shape of a pyramid. Oh. Mm-hmm. Now, let me see if I can find the, uh, who, uh, who did the Klaus Donner stuff on the... Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Original publication, now you've got to correct this, I made a mistake. The original, the first, uh, the earliest publication on Nomali figurines we can find is a Thompson Thompson in Africa, out of New York in 1854. And as interestingly, four years later, he had a, a master collection of uh, ten Nomali for his, himself. Hmm. So, how did they arrive? Where was the name of the, the Nomali? How, how was that arrived at? Is that actually um, a being or? Yes, yes. I mean, they are called other names, but the. Uh, Okay, so Thor Howard Ollier led the first Easter Island expedition in 1955. Let me do this right here. So it was 1955 when Thor Howard led the first Easter Island expedition and, and, this, and found what they called secret cave stones. They're also called Mau Ai Ma'e. Best I can pronounce. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things you need to see written and then try to work it out yourself, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and here, I mean, here's what, here's a quote. I'm going to quote Thor Hardal in, in 1957 from Aku Aku. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let me get a drink here, sir. This way I'll give you the accurate things. You can choose which ones to use. Is it okay, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. I'm going to quote Thor Heyerdahl here from Aku Aku, London, 1957. <clears throat> to quote Thor from Aku Aku, London, 1957. Small figures in the secret caves on the island. The resemblance between Nomali and some of these figurines seems to be closer than to any of the stone figures found in other parts of West Africa. These cave figures were hidden in secret family caves and handed down from one generation to the next. Not only is there an amazing stylistic and apparently functional resemblance between these figures and Nomali, but holes in the head are common among both groups of figures. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, Easter Island is very mysterious in its own right anyway, isn't it? For uh... Yes, yes. We are, it's still a mystery today, most of uh, before, where those uh, monoliths came from. Yeah, so um, back to, yeah, I'll answer that question. Let me just, I'd like to find the, the test on um, the chromium, on who analyzed the chromium ball. I believe that was in Austria, too, but yeah, definitely I definitely want to answer that. Mm-hmm. We've got all the sound effects anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right, we'll have to see if we can find out later. Anyways, uh, so what are... Let me start without the squeaky. So what are Nomon? Where did they originate? Where are they found? They're unlike most, if not all, of the figurines you found, well, to be found around other parts of the world, most often in temple sites or grave sites. No Mali are dug and found randomly in the jungles of West Africa. No one really knows who buried them or why in that it is a an oral um, tradition, not a written tradition within those countries. Hmm. <coughs> 
<clears throat> and that'll get her. There we go. The Nomali have other names within various tribes, but the presiding name is Nomali. That ref- reflects and represents the gods which lived in the heavens long ago. These gods were said to have misbehaved, and their punishment, as probably you and I, David, maybe faced the same punishment, was to be rained down upon earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> I don't know what I'd ever do, but uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, now they were rained down upon the earth, and with them came their sky. Part of their, 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 well, their sky turned to stone, and they turned to stone, and they were beings of stone, men of stone, Nomali. They came down, and they lived among the humans. They were large. They were able to speak in a manner that when they spoke in one village, they could be heard in villages far away. Their eyes were said to glare and shine like the sun and could not be looked directly into for a period of time. And they bestowed upon the natives these figurines, which the natives contend they were the ones who created. And along with them came direction, instruction on how to utilize them to better their lives to bless those who are suffering, and to teach messages, uh, valuable messages, to the entire uh, civilization and to us connect to chiefs and others and important figures such as medicine men and medicine women, uh, chiefs, the Zoe, uh, the uh, female secret society, the oldest hmm still existing female secret society in the world. And uh, and they were instructed how to utilize the stones and to, for various reasons, different stones are obviously when you view them, you can see designed to represent various blessings that they would bestow upon those utilizing them. Right, so there's a, a, a definite religious co- connection there, way before Christianity, for instance. Oh, yes. They, the natives who, who I am in touch with would contend that uh, they often say 10,000 years, but that could mean much longer. Hmm. That just means long ago. There are those who have, I have taken the stones to various sensitive and those who are in tune more than I and can read stones and they have varied in their opinions but most start at 10 to 13 thousand years or more is what they feel off the stone I can't of course uh, only say that there's uh, no other way to uh, there's no uh, uh, a scientific way to identify how old stone is Mm. so we're researching any other methods which have potential. And in that regard, some have stated they are 100,000 years old. There have been more than one stone whisperers, as I refer to them as, who have sensed that they were connected to uh, Atlantis. The There is a connection also, as far as the name, there's a connection to the Dogon. The Dogon tribe out of Mali, which is directly connected to the countries where Nomali come from. And the uh, Dogon Empire, the Mali Empire, rather, that um, ruled uh, also in those countries for years. And so there is a contention. We, we, uh, there's a possibility we have uncovered that there is a connection in that the Nomos which were also gods which came from the sky, descended in a ship, and um, that they then somehow developed linguistically from Nomos to the Nomos of Mali and inevitably would have been shortened to Nomali. Now, the interesting thing about that is, of course, the Dogon are said to be descendants of the ancient Egyptians genealogically, or 
Is it the other way around? There are many who contend, and this is why it's interesting that the blue stones were found in a pyramid shape. That's very curious. Hmm. There are those who contend that pyramids existed long ago, not only in folklore, but there are those in scientific community who question whether the first ever pyramids appeared in Egypt and were that size and had that, you know, that was the first ones you'd build. So there were those who contended that those, that there was a, uh, and a, a, uh, expeditions and there was a settlement of and, and information passed on from an ancient civilization which was very far advanced for its time and that civilization was was said by many to have existed in West Africa and so the contention is that there could be pyramids which have been long absorbed into the jungle hmm. and then there are those also who would atta- would contend that uh Atlantis was would be would have been properly placed off the coast of West Africa. So uh, those are some of the theories. Hmm. Well, I have seen. I've got a note here that uh, the Mali got some amphibian. They could have been amphibious creatures. Um, is that correct? <laughs> well, the, the Nomos uh, of the Dogon were definitely amphibious. The Nomali stones, as one I'm looking at right now, sometimes have crocodiles connected to humans or to Nomali-looking figures. Some of the figures more represent human form. Others more represent what the traditional beliefs are of the Nomos, of the Nomali gods. So my understanding is from the natives still to this day that they highly revere the crocodile, because it is able to live and and prosper and indeed hunt on the land and in the water, and that there is a connection between them and the Nomali, which would possibly lead to their being amphibious uh, beings. Hmm. And it also puts us in the direction of uh, reptilian aliens as well, doesn't it? <laughs> if you've got any sort of... Um um, idea what I'm talking about there is that we do hear a lot about uh, reptilians. I don't know what you yes, make of yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm not uh, qualified to classify between all the different aliens. I just haven't met enough of them yet. No, <laughs> no. I mean, I, I, I mean, I've, I've actually spoken to a few people. You've had a number of them on your show. Uh, yeah, you I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've heard. Uh, you know, I mean, I've never seen one myself, but I do know of people that I trust. To tell me that they are telling me the truth that they have seen them. So, you know, yeah. and, and of course that would be an interdimensional type being rather, uh, or I don't know, ex- extraterrestrial or and uh, interdimensional maybe. I don't know. I just wonder what you what you thought about that. You know, what, yeah, when you, when, you spoke, when you when you said about the crocodile, I thought, oh, there's the old re- reptilian connection again. Yeah, I, I'm very careful, David, in in that I realize my my position is for whatever reason I been placed in a great opportunity and responsibility to introduce, reintroduce the Nomali to the world. Mm. With that comes also the responsibility to somewhat keep my opinion on things uh, restrained, especially if I'm not educated on them. Yeah, sure. Because the most important thing, I think, is to let those who are informed and educated and are doing research in various areas, let them get their hands on one of the authentic Nomali, activate it, and see what they feel. There are those who would I, I'm sure feel they're in tune with the reptilian alien culture and alien connection, the energy. And if they were to feel one, they may get messages from their their uh, home base, if you will, or their origins. Uh, I'm not I'm not qualified to say either way. I'm just really excited to see as we go forward what is discovered in today's world because you know things are opening up and there's oh yeah there's new ways of uh, of experimentation and new methods of of reading subtle changes when a, something like a stone enters a room full of people or with one person if it's for the healing purpose or for meditation and uh, so yeah I mean I'm open to all those things but again I'm just not that qualified on anything except Nomali I know more about Nomali than most anybody else hmm. well I don't think there's any experts in the, like UFOs or or anything look, look, anyway I think we all we're all trying to uh, get at, get at the truth and uh, we're all trying to pick up little, little bits of information from each other <laughs> you know that doesn't yeah, yeah, awesome. I, yeah. I'm really interested as I said in those who are more in tune 
um, what they can tell me, because they, they'd be more capable than those who have spent decades of their lives refining their connection to those things and their knowledge and experience. And, and uh, you know, they would be the ones who would be very excited to get their, their perspective. Yeah, sure. You'll have to have a listen to a few of my older shows. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a, hey, you spent, um, I mean, how many episodes of Ancient Aliens have you appeared on? I know you've appeared oh, there was only one that they, they've ever covered in Omali. In fact, it was, uh, it was related to the Dogon. Oh, right. I thought they would have been more interesting, you know, because since it's such an interesting subject, you'd think there'd be more episodes where it's been included. Did you actually, yeah, did uh, you actually work or meet Eric Von Danken and, uh, George Tuklas? No, no, I did not. I, I reached out to them some years ago and, and, uh, kept, continued to point out that the Nomali were very unique and, hmm. and, uh, uh, I thought it was a very interesting subject matter, but, uh, you know, they, uh, they've got their, Parameters and and only when it fell within the purview of the connection to the Dogon, they they recognized there was a significance there. But um, you know we're working on developing um, an episodic uh, program that will follow the Nomali from the origins straight through to today as they're being being utilized in healings and meditations in the last couple of years. Oh, excellent! That sounds as interesting. They, yeah. yeah. So, uh, unless, you know, we're certainly open to someone else there. I was recently contacted by another, uh, casting director, producer for a, an upcoming show that will do a, a segment on them. And, but I think it's very cool that guys like you, David, are the first person where your audience will ever come in contact with an Omali. So I've been focusing on that. The podcast is the way to go, hmm. um, because, People like you have spent your time and efforts to develop an audience with those who are receptive and are the right people to, in my opinion, to put these stones before. So I'm excited when someone like you is willing to do a show because I'm very confident that there will be few people. Now, I will make an exception for your show because not only your people are highly in tune, but you're in England. Hmm. And there has been a long-standing interest in Nomali stones in England, much more than in America. In fact, the British royalty have a, a sizable collection Do they? of original Nomali stones. And yes, yes. And uh, I mean, in 1926 at the Imperial Show, was it 26? And the Imperialistic Show. That was a bit before my time, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, the there were booths set up for all the countries which were at that time under the rule of England. Right. And in the booth for West Africa, Sierra Leone, I think it was. Yes, they gave out little Nomali one-inch figurines. And uh, again, they were so. Here's the interesting thing: they were so highly collected and so uh, desired at one point in time that thousands and thousands. And many thousands of of uh, replicas, I would call them at best, or perhaps you could call them fakes, mm. were produced and sold throughout the world. And if you look on eBay right now, or any local, well, not probably just eBay, you know your local places will have them, but you will find nomalies out there for um, that are most likely, you know, very high, 99 plus percent, um, are part of that. Uh, sold when they were so desirable throughout the world that people were acquiring them. Yeah. Well, as soon as we finish off of here, I'm going to go straight onto eBay and have a look. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. And then I'll phone the Queen up tomorrow and find out about her collection. Yes, we'd love to see that. <laughs> but, um, yes, yeah, that's, that's quite fascinating. I mean, obviously, you know, this show's going out around the world, so you, you, obviously there's going to be a few people, even, even if it's just a, a, another dozen people. I'm, I'm sure it's going to be more than that. But uh, more people will know more about the Nomali Stones now after this show anyway. <laughs> Um, I, that's it, a beautiful thing. It, Thank you. That is the thing, isn't it? I mean, it, it's made me more into, you know, I want to look more into it. And obviously you've got a good website as well to go to, um, which we'll sort of give the link to towards the end of the show. Um, well, here's a question I got to ask. Did David Young choose the Nomali stones or did the Nomali figurines choose 
David Young. Ah, what? Well, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've got to say that I do think that there are powers that point us towards these. You know, that, that actually made me want to contact you to get you on the show. I think you, you, I think you're going in the right direction now. I think we do get guidance from, if you, if you want to call it you know, the other side or uh, a spiritual being of some sort. I really do think that. You know. Yeah. Well, obviously, the as you become the by today, the first contact for all of these individuals listening, there has been a um, somehow you're the guy, and um, that's because you've earned that that uh, trust and reliability and connection with those people, and and you're the right guy to introduce them to this re-emerging powerful energy and let them be part of it. Yeah, it could. But I mean, I, the first thing, I mean, what really set me on this road was Eric Von Daniken's uh, Chariots of the Gods. Obviously, we all know, you know, 50 years ago, or, or more, than, more than 50 years ago now, that's what kind of set me off on this path. Um, and I have to say that I've actually been lucky enough to actually meet Eric Von Daniken a couple of times, to be, to be honest. And awesome. he, Yeah, he's an amazing man. And... Uh, yeah, it's uh, well, I'm not going to sort of blow me on trumpet. I'm just saying it, it, it was great to actually meet a man that uh, actually set me off on this path in the first place. It was quite mind blowing, you know. But um, sure, the movie came out, and that was the first introduction to this theory. The book was before that. Yeah. It was about the. I think well, the first time I read it was the late 1970s. And yes, that was the the consummate and really the sole source for that. Theory. Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think Eric which he says that it was um, ancient, you know, aliens coming down to, because there's actually a question mark after the chariots of the gods, isn't there? So he's actually yeah. opening your mind to that possibility. Um, and obviously, a lot of his research and other people's research has actually suggested that we did have ancient aliens here. Um, I think, I mean, there's so many. Um, monoliths and buildings and things that have been built over the uh, over the ancient times that even today we'd have trouble building them um you know I, do, do you do your gut feeling you you must think that, that we did have an ancient civilization before it got destroyed on this planet i am uh, certainly not at all as presumptuous as to think that i would discount the possibilities of any ancient civilizations and I certainly from what I have seen have uh, have a strong strong sense that we have been supported along the way by God in whatever form he decides is uh, is part of that and then also I'm sure there are those who and I've met them who contend that the alien forces have been very negative and I don't doubt that there could be negative hmm. and uh, hurt aliens as far as how long ago have we existed. You know, I try not to determine for sure anything that I wasn't there, and I'm, I can't remember being there. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it certainly appears as though we've been here a lot longer. Each day there are new discoveries which set the clock back further and further into time as far as civilizations and as far as advanced civilizations throughout the world. Yeah, indeed. And even on this planet alone, there's so many different um, species of life, isn't there, on this planet, that uh, it seems ridiculous to me to think that of all the stars and planets out there, that there's not other civilizations, and probably civilizations that are maybe a million years in advance of us, you know, and, um, you know, so there's no reason why they can't be coming here or have come here in the past now I'm not one of those who contends that each and every advancement that mankind has made has been at the behest and with the uh, puppeteering of aliens I'm a firm believer that human nature and our our beings our souls our spirits are powered independently and I'm a uh, my, my sense is that we are helped by those uh, any forces that can that we were, are open to along the way, um, yeah, and that's a good thing. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah, I, I think that. I do think we do get guidance from, if you want to call it the other side, the spiritual world, or that's um. 
<laughs> well, I think throughout the, from what I've seen throughout the history of mankind, it is, it is not uncommon, even in today's world, for people to recognize that if they want any type of solace, just getting through a difficult time or support or help for prosperity, or if they just want to connect, that they think of and pray for the spirits of their ancestors to be engaged. And I certainly would think it's only natural that those spirits having left the planet are always willing and happy to come back down and be of assistance, just waiting to be called. Hmm. And along with those, of course, we know from all ancient sources that there are many angels and there are many demons. And these things are also uh, available to be received. How that crosses over into the ancient aliens, I certainly probably beyond my comprehension uh, exactly how all that might work or does work. But again, um, I, in my opinion, it's great to be open to these blessings and wherever they come. And there certainly has been a, a blockage of and a uh, besmirchment and a darkening and demonization of things which come out of the jungles of Africa, mm. hasn't it? Yeah, definitely. Oh, well, you seem to think there was a, also uh, an Atlantis, because uh, you mentioned it earlier. Um, and you, do you think that that was off, of, off the coast of Africa? Oh, I don't have any idea. I just know that there are those who believe of Atlantis, and Lemuria is the other one I recall. Yeah. Mm. If I'm not mistaken. And, and that there are many who believe of it, and those who contend that it was an island, and those who contend it was part of an still existing uh, mainland. But uh, I do understand there are those who contend it is off the coast of Africa, West Africa. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I have made a study of that. I Really, I was on my missions uh, completely unrelated, and and uh, only by happenstance, fate, whatever, ended up as the spokesperson for the Nomali figurines. <laughs> it wasn't uh, – I had no plans on this. But uh, it's a great opportunity to be part of the same point in time but i am not i am not up on um the uh, things that most of your listeners will be up on as far as other related and ancillary mm. subject matters and you yourself are much more advanced than i in those areas well i wouldn't say that but so <laughs> but so obviously you were guided in that direction as well i think you must have been i've always been very interested in things of the, sp- of the spirit world and uh things which are uh tools to activate the powers of God on, on the planet. Mm. Do you, I, I guess, you, I'm, I'm probably asking you a silly question here, I guess you don't do any sort of like um, investigations, um, like paranormal investigations or anything like that? No, I'm an investigative reporter, but my my uh, beat, if you will, is, the, is uh, well, I'm also an advocate and a consultant to those who are falsely accused and those who are maligned by government. Right. That's really those so, so my investigative uh, ex- expertise is is in that area and has been developed for, for quite some years. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Well, I know it goes out of the parameters of this show, but uh, it's, an, uh, it's an interesting subject, I have to say. Um, yeah, and in that regard, I'm a filmmaker. I uh, produce, investigate, and then I... I go, you know, covert ops and overt ops and, and psych ops, and what we do is we investigate, we uncover evidence about those who are perpetrating damage upon citizens, and then we expose them through the internet and uh, drive them to do the right thing. Well, that, that is relatively treacherous. I've been charged with many a crime along the way for exposing those in power. Have you? And representing myself. Uh, pro se throughout, I've been able to, and f- with the help of God, I've ended up with the film footage most times to prove the other side. The police were perjuring themselves. The, wow. Uh, so I faced, uh, you know, they've charged me with charges which would have amassed to 20 or 30 years in prison at least over the last 18 and a half years. Um, yes. Well, I'm just a couple obviously you're still walking around, so they, they didn't stick. Yeah, well, I've been, you know, it's, it's been hairy. The last uh, a couple of years ago, they had the Attorney General of Pennsylvania prosecuting me for some bogus charges, and then the judge chimed in and accused me of interfering with the law. And uh, so combined, they were looking at a nine-year 
sentence, but at the last minute I was able to publish and put on the Internet the footage of the actual incident, and then all people, and, and also the audio testimony of the witnesses committing perjury aligned with the actual footage. <laughs> and the charges were sub- uh, subsequently dropped. Hmm. It's interesting you say all that because, as you know, there's a, uh, after the presidential election, which is a, there's all sorts of problems going on. I don't know if you've got any opinions on that. I know it's not really in the parameters of this show, but I think it's a very interesting subject about what's going on with the uh, investigations of fraud at the moment. Yeah, my focus is on local judges and uh, state and local elected officials and those police officers and their uh, the police industrial complex. Mm. So I focus 100% on those, and I really have to divest myself of things that I have no control or power over, such as presidential elections at this point in time. I'm not engaged in those missions. No, no I can understand. It's quite a big subject anyway. I mean, I mean, obviously, I think anybody read or look at my material would understand I'm a libertarian. I want uh, the rights of citizens to be foremost and the growth of government and the control of government to be minimalized and eliminated. So yeah. I'm really for the freedom of people, so it's hard for me to, um, you know, to get engaged in anything that doesn't help people get further freedom. Yeah. And um, I'm not sure that I could be of impact on the national level, although you, know, you, you never know in the future. But as it's been thus far, I'm fully engaged with the operations that I'm on at this point in time on the level and, and in the regions that I'm operating. Yeah. I mean, from what I hear, a lot of it, it seems like this world is heading for a major um, communism-controlled world. The way things are going, um, yeah, I don't know what for your because that must come into the parameter of what you're talking about as well. Well, I'm certainly not interested in socialism, communism, or anybody else where the government takes more control over the individuals. Yeah. Right, especially in my beat, which has been again primarily in the courts and, and focused also on the divorce courts and those courts which take children from acu- parents accused, mm-hmm. those uh, children protective agencies, if you will. And we have found abuse and uh, just abuse of humans and children along the way is, is, is just ubiquitous to their formula. And we've been able to expose those who are doing that. But, um, you know, in other words, what I'm saying, that any government program that starts out to help people, the more power they get over citizens, the more people are hurt. Mm. And, uh, you know, we have seen time after time where children are taken by false accusations because there's a 24-year-old snot brat children's uh, youth officer who comes in with the authority to determine that somebody shouldn't have their child because... Primarily, mostly because they get in a pissing match. Yeah, with the yeah. They come in, they're arrogant, they're obstinate. They have no children of their own, and quite often they've been raised in foster care. These are the people that they put out there to go out and determine. Then they take children, sometimes from very good parents, and put them into the households of those who are farming, essentially raising as many children as they can get from the state on a day-by-day basis. They get paid. Mm. And the agencies themselves get funded on how many children they keep. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. So, oh yeah. So now, fortunately, we've been able to. We the first one of the first cases that I took on fifteen years ago. Now fourteen. She just turned fifteen. I'm still in touch with her. Was a child taken wrongfully, and we were able to get her back. Uh, she was one year old at the time, and and uh, then the evidence which we uncovered was used in a lawsuit in the first ever in the state of Pennsylvania that someone won a lawsuit against children and youth and there were senatorial hearings and changes purported to be made yada yada mm-hmm. ying ying but you know we do what we can along the way and, and try to help uh, parents get their children back from the government if the government's taking them wrongfully because as you know David once the government makes a decision they all route. Yeah, it's very difficult to change, get out of it. I agree. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. And in England, I've been contacted, and my work as Daddy Justice is my moniker in that regard. And um, I've been contacted for many years by people out of England who are fighting this battle through the courts, mostly fathers who have been maligned by the current um, 
uh, prejudice within the court, mm. but also mothers who, again, have had their children wrongfully taken once the government got involved. Sure. I'm sure there'll be people listening to this that this uh, resonates with. So uh, if there's anyone listening out there, do you know who to get in contact with now? <laughs> No, I'm retiring from that. I'm <laughs> retiring from that. I'm 61 years old. And yeah, yeah, no. no. I was only joking. That's right. I'm sure. I'm trying to <laughs> I keep getting more cases from I'm trying to retire. Yeah, I understand. I suppose we will go back to the. I tell you, you, you um, there's an American art museum that um, that uh, displays a lot of these um, artifacts. Is that right? What happened was, some years ago, when I did try to find others who knew anything about the Mali, I finally ascended to the level where I found the, well, I believe still to be one of the foremost experts. And that is a Professor Kwaku Afoyanza, who was born in Ghana, but has for, who, who did for many decades, uh, preside in the, as a professor of African art in Howard University, a very prestigious university in, in the Washington, D.C. area. And, uh, and Professor Kwaku Freyanza was very excited when he saw that we had uh, such a collection of, of the Nomali. And after he did identify that, he uh, told me that he was the curator at the African Art Museum of Maryland, the oldest African art museum in, in America, I believe. And uh, he endorsed... The gone, a wonderful woman who put that together and has spirited that for many decades is just so such a nice person. Mm. And, uh, and they decided that uh, they wanted to exhibit the stone, so we did put uh, our collection on exhibit at their museum, which I, as far as I know is maybe the largest exhibit, at least in recent times in America, and maybe anywhere. I know of no other. And... Um, we first exhibited them for a number of months, and I think it was a couple of years at least until they uh, were willing to let us have them back, which was okay. It was great to see people appreciate them and enjoy them and and uh, and be reawakened. Yeah, you know, we've got an amazing British Museum here. Would we find anything like that in there? Oh, I think there's definitely going to be Nomali in the British Museum. Right. Especially, as I said, because of the fact that uh, England was so uh, heavily involved mm. in that region. And they were highly desirable. And as I mentioned before, that the, the Royal Palace, my understanding, and that information came from Professor Kwakur Faryanza, that the uh, British royalty had an extensive collection of Nomali that they would have gathered long ago. Very interesting. I must, I must make a mission to go and have a look. Yes. <laughs> well, now they may be in their private quarters. Yeah, yeah no, I didn't mean the Queen's collection. I'm, I'm in the uh, British Museum. <laughs> yeah, the British Museum. They'll be out front. Yeah. Well, maybe not. Maybe you know. I'm sure if you ask the curator, they yeah. just have some downstairs. But I would. I mean, I would sure like to think optimistically that they haven't been washed out of there too. Hmm. and suppressed out of the British Museum. I, I would think that they would be on exhibit some of the best examples around the world. Yeah, I guess we be. could probably check online to see if they've got anything in there anyway. But, uh, yes. Yeah, it's certainly interesting. And there are, there is, are no Mali at the Bronx Museum in New York. There are a couple. There, they have been, uh, I think, the Minneapolis Museum. And out in, uh, in Southern California, there's uh, always been an interest. And, uh, and they've been... They certainly have had Nomali at Sotheby's auction in New York, and I'm and at Sotheby's auction in England. I'm sure they have sold right. Nomali. Do you think there's a few fakes out there as well? Oh, the thousands and thousands. <laughs> of yeah, fakes. I think that's always the worry, isn't it? But, uh, well, it's it, that's you know at the same point in time that there are, uh, you know, I come from a Roman Catholic background, and there are crucifixes and. And plastic figurines of saints and all that. And if people get a connection to the Nomali through it, then that's okay. But I certainly don't want to see people be hoodwinked into thinking that fakes are authentic. Sure. Yeah. Anyway, so you've got a book coming, they're coming out, hopefully, or is it a, and also a, a TV series. Yeah. In today's world, I'm, I think it's possible. And I don't know if it'll be television or internet, 
but it's likely it will be Internet, and it appears as though that may be forthcoming before, you know, before the, uh, the book. Really? But the book will be fun, too. We're going to first publish just a coffee table book and utilize the images of the stones as the feature, and then, of course, we'll do a compendium of the, you know, all the knowledge which we have assembled. In a separate book. Sure. Is it, have you got a title for it, or is it just going to be called in the Mali Stones? You know, as far as I know, it may just be called No Mali. Right. Because as far as I know, there's, um, uh, or no, yeah, No Mali figurines, rather, because as far as I know, there is no uh, such book that would have been previously uh, published. And I think the simplest, the better. Perhaps we may end up with, you know, that's a working title, but of, uh, what we're looking at is Nomali figurines. Yeah, well, it's something, to be something to be yeah. looking out for anyway. Yeah. Yeah, but I think it, it seems like there's more interest in, in, uh, internet. There's, uh, the production values we have are, are right for the current internet. And, uh, you know, particularly if you look at our website, ancientalienstones.com, you'll see videos of, uh, of my friend Jeff, the village mystic in Bradenton, Florida, who's been using the stones for a couple of years in healings and now has some paranormal footage of his use of the stones in the healing. Hmm. And uh, you'll see, I think there's some footage of meditation, but also the first ever footage of Nomali in the bush that... We have been able to find that we sent an expedition in to gather last year. Hmm. So it's ancientaliens.com, yeah? Uh, ancient Alien Stones. Ancientalienstones.com. So if anyone wants to search that out, I certainly will. <laughs> anyway, Ben, it's been a fantastically it's interesting show. Well. Thank you. Yeah, what's, what was cool for anybody is... There's a video on the website of the museum exhibit, and if you just want to jump right to four minutes and 20 seconds into that, you'll begin to see uh, a number of the stones, the figurines. So the people, if they want to, since, you know, if they're like me, they're ADD, and, and they want to jump right to the, the yeah. let me see what the stones look like. What do these figurines look like? Do I connect to any of them? Mm. Do they mean something to me? And uh, so I would invite your listeners to go to the website and go to the museum exhibit and go to 4 minutes and 20 seconds in and, and take a look at Nomali for the first time uh, gratis of David Young <laughs> thank you Ben <laughs> yeah I'll put a link on the uh, Paranormal Dimensions page anyway for anyone that uh, might have missed that or uh, so well, it's been fantastic Ben thank you very much for coming on and talking to me sparing the time I know you're a very busy man I'll let you get back to whatever you were doing before I interrupted you not at all thank you <laughs> and um, keep in touch and uh, hope to speak to you again hey thank you on behalf of me and Nomali yeah. for reintroducing them to the country of England well yeah I, 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 well, you've given them a, a, yeah, the information to put get out there for people so uh, I'll, I'll be looking into it a bit so and around the world. Yes, yeah, I know you absolutely. Have yeah. <laughs> anyway, thanks, Ben. I'll uh, let you go now. Thank you very much. And um, peace. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Well, you've been listening to Paranormal Dimensions. I'm David Young on the Paranormal UK Radio Network. And um, hope you join me again next week. Thank you. Bye bye. Paranormal Dimensions is as bright and powerful as our celestial star, the Sun. And although it's expending thousands of pounds of energy every minute of the day, have no fear. There's plenty left.
Paranormal Dimensions is a regular feature on Mondays on the Paranormal UK radio network.